Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal of the Continuing Church of God. Today I'd like to talk about English translations of the Bible. We've been going through a series of sermons and messages on a draft book that we have called Who Gave the World the Bible? And I've gone through sources of manuscripts and why certain ones are better and which books of the Bible are appropriate uh, and why so-called extra books or lost books are not. And uh, differences between Greek text, Septuagint, and all that, uh, and the Hebrew Masoretic text. Today I want to go through some stuff about English translations, because uh, one, I speak English, and two, a lot of people, people who are watching this do. And if, I've been asked numerous times over the years about English translations. Now there's dozens of translations of the Bible in the English language. And I've read several of them completely through, as well as parts of at least dozens of them. One of the earliest English translations was done by uh, John Wycliffe. He was an Oxford professor and scholar and a theologian. In the 1380s, uh, he produced dozens of handwritten English language manuscript copies of the scriptures. Now they were translated out of the Latin Vulgate, which was the only uh, source text available to it at the time. And the Latin Vulgate was something that uh, Jerome originally put together. I'd like to read uh, something uh, about this. Until John Wycliffe, the translated New Testament, excuse me, until John Wycliffe translated the New Testament, only a small portions of the Bible have been translated into English. The English language traces its roots back to about AD 600. You know, there was no really English language before then, and people weren't really called English then. Anyway, what's the significance of the English, uh, of the Wycliffe translation? It was the first complete Bible in English, in fact, the first complete Bible in any modern European language, and two, it indirectly began to break down the power structures of the religious political machinery of the Roman Catholic Church. This is from Bible.org, I just read this. Now, in 1525, there's somebody named William Tyndale. He went to Germany, and he translated Erasmus's 1516 Greek text into the English language. And we'll talk a little bit more Erasmus later. We talked about him before. And in 1525-1526, the Tyndale uh, New Testament became the first printed edition of Scripture in the English language. Now, the English King Henry VIII and various uh, Catholic bishops burned any copies they could get their hands on. Many later translation translators, including those associated with the King James Version, used many parts of his uh, translation. As a matter of fact, over 80% of the New Testament and over 70% of the Old Testament. Now, Tyndale was tried for heresy and treason, and after conviction, he was strangled and burnt at the stake in the prison yard in, on October 6, 1536. So his reward for trying to get the, for actually producing the, a Bible, getting a printed Bible in the English language, uh, he got killed for it. Now, a few years later, in 1539, something that's known as the Great Bible was produced. In 1568, a revision of the Great Bible, known as the Bishop's Bible, was introduced. Now, despite 19 editions being printed between 1568 and 1606, this Bible was referred to as the rough draft of the King James Version. Now, Miles Cloverdale, John Fox, Thomas Sampson, William Whittingham, associated with John Calvin and John Knox, put together an English translation in Geneva, Switzerland. The New Testament was completed in 1557, and the complete Bible was first published. That Bible complete was first published in 1560, and it became known as the Geneva Bible. And I've read parts of that. Interestingly, though, the Geneva Bible itself retains over 90% of William Tyndale's original English translation, and that's one of the problems I've noticed with translators. They just look at what somebody did a long time ago, and they just pick it up a lot. Now, before going any further. Perhaps I should mention that Protestant reformer Martin Luther translated the New Testament into German. And that was published in 1522. And then a Bible with the Old Testament and the Apocrypha, which was published in 1534. Now, the problem, one of the problems was that Martin Luther uh, mistranslated parts of it, admitted that he added some to support some of his views. And more on that is in a book that we have called Hope of Salvation, How the Continuing Church of God Differs from Protestantism. Uh, this book and any other book I may hold up uh, is free online. You can go to www.ccog.org. 
go on the literature tab under on the top, go under books and booklets, and you'll find it. We don't ask for your email address or anything. You can just read it. And by the way, it's highly referenced and full of scriptures. Now, the King James Version of the Bible, I've got a kind of a picture of the 1611 version of it. So let's talk about that. The uh, Protestant clergy approached uh, King James I in 1604 and announced their desire for a new translation to replace the Bishop's Bible. And King James authorized the translation. The first edition came out in 1611. It was textually, its text was about 95% the same as the Geneva Bible, which again was 90% from William Tyndale, which means despite having a large team of translators, it relied heavily on Tyndale's work. Now, many Protestants have considered the King James Version as the best translation, and part of the reason, that's part of the reason why they call it the authorized version. But is the original King James Version the one you can completely trust? Will some Protestants view the King James Version as essentially inspired by God and above all others? Uh, uh, so I'd like to read something from a, quote, Holiness Church, Methodist Holiness, uh, Holiness Church. We wholeheartedly endorse the use of the authorized version of the Bible is the final authority in our English-speaking churches and schools. Now that church is entitled to do that as opposed to considering the original language divinely inspired, but is that biblically wise? I don't think so. Yet some others agree that it is. I'd like to read something from a Protestant group that's called Chick Publications. The King James Bible is a true and direct translation from the original languages. What if you found out it's the one English Bible that deserves your complete trust? The King James should be the only Bible you need and can completely trust. Trusting the King James Version. Build your faith in God's Word by learning why you can trust the King James Version alone and why it's the most accurate translation into English. Okay, now that was from their website. Now I've got... Uh, something about a book they have on it, and here's what it says. The King James, same group, the King James Bible was translated by men whose agenda was to give the exact meaning of the Greek or Hebrew originals without injecting their personal biases. Amazingly, Puritan members of the Church of England had to come together and agree on each verse of the 1189 chapters of the Bible, going over the text at least 14 times. God used that process to take out personal denominational bias. What was left was a true interpretation stripped of personal opinions or interpretations. Now that's the claim. It gets even worse. It says, every new Bible version that rolls off, off the press is an insult to our Lord. So anything that came after the King James Version, your publication says, is an insult to God. And here's... Uh, from something they have called the Catholic Church give us the Bible. Because in 1611, the most important event happened. God's preserved words were published, perfectly translated into English. Soon King James held the book. Now, is that view of the King James Bible accurate? No. But when people hear this nonsense, a lot of them just eat it up. Now, I'm going to say that the King James Version is superior in several ways to many translations. But it was translated by men. Despite claims that at least 14 times each scripture went over, the doctrinal bias was included, not eliminated. Humans are fallible. The Bible says, let God be true and all men a liar. It's not an insult to God for humans to try to improve translation errors with later translations. Yet, a Protestant by the name of Jack Hiles asserted, quote, that the King James is not a version, but the Bible. No, the King James Version is a translation, hence a version. It's not the actual Bible, because the Old Testament, almost all that was inspired to be written in Hebrew, and the New Testament in Greek. Uh, there's a little bit of Aramaic in both. But the King James is just a translation. Furthermore, Dr. William Grady pushes, quote, the King James Bible as the true Bible for English-speaking people. And here's something from the United Kingdom. King James Bible. Translation was ordained by God and not man. 
This is from H. Denny's The Final Destination, Destination of Man. Now that last statement indicates that God ordained and made the King James Version of the Bible perfect translation. But this is not true. Uh, as far as being unbiased, it's simply not true. You know, these arguments remind me of the same ones that the Eastern Orthodox bring up. They believe that even though God inspired Moses and others to write the Old Testament in Hebrew, that it had to be fixed and made better by a group of uh, Greek Jews uh, who uh, translated what's called the Septuagint. Now I think that's blasphemous because they could you can't improve the Word of God, but that's kind of how the people who say King James only uh, push all this stuff. You, it's not correct to say you completely trust the King James, uh, New King, the King James version of the Bible, or that God inspired it or ordained it to be perfect. That's not the case. Now, furthermore, I'd like to uh, read the following quote from S. Ehrlich's "False Teaching and Divisive Movements." Schisms in Modern Day Christendom. He wrote, The 1611 King James Version was edited several times to correct minor translation errors or changes in spelling in 1612, 1613, 1616, 1629, 1638, 1660, 1683, 1727, 1762, 1769, and 1873. So, which of those times did God inspire it? Everyone? God couldn't get it right the first time? Now, the King James Version was originally written over 400 years ago. And in that time, the English language has gone through many changes. Now, uh, somebody who is a, a supporter, but not totally with us, I would say, but just moving that, seems like in that, in that direction, sent me this leaf. This is a leaf from the uh, King James Bible, uh, the 1611 version. This was printed in the first half of the 1600s. And uh, see the name on the plaque down here as well. But I showed you this particular portion here because I'm going to actually uh, read what it says, pronouncing this in modern English. This is going to be uh, Deuteronomy 16, verse 1. And you can look in your version of the Bible if you want as well. Anyway, the original King James, which I have, I just showed it, put it up here. It says, Averbe the moneth of Abib, and keep the path over unto the Lord thy God. For an ammonioth of Abib, the Lord thy God, brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. Okay? I mentioned this in previous messages, but words and letters changed, and so that's one of the reasons why we don't use the Old King James all the time. And I've read you from the original Old King James, not the one that's gone through, was it, almost a dozen trans adjustments? Okay. And they also don't seem want to tell you the original King J New King, me, Old King James had the Apocrypha in it as well. Now, there are sometimes texts in the uh, King James Version that are cleared up by more modern versions. Of, of the Bible. But as far as the, uh, King James goes, I've got a list, and it's in, it's, it's in this book uh, that I held up before about uh, who gave the world the Bible. It's in our book there. And I've got a list uh, here, and here, and here, and here of translation issues. Now, I'm going to go through some of them right here. This is from the late uh, Richard Nichols, uh, who I did a little bit of work with uh, a while back. And again, uh, all these are in our book here, so I don't think I'm going to read all of them. But he starts off with Genesis 1-2. says, it should read, the earth became without form. The word translated was is heia, uh, and denotes a condition different from the former conditions. Genesis 10-9 uh, should read, Nimrod, the mighty hunter in place of the Lord, the word before is incorrect and gives a connotation that Nimrod was a good guy, which is false. Ex Leviticus 16, 8, 10, 26, the King James is scapegoat, which has a connotation of someone's unjustly blamed. The Hebrew word is azazel, which means one removed or separated. And 
goes through lots and lots and lots of errors with the uh, uh, Old King James. And I'm not going to I'm not going to read all of them here. Uh, one of the other ones uh, that I will read is Hebrews 4 9. He says, should read, there remains therefore keeping the Sabbath the people of God. And that's correct, and that's what it should say, but it, does, it doesn't say that. It, it uh, says there remains a rest for the people of God, and the word rest there is not the same Greek word that's used in other parts of the New Testament. It's a different word, sabbatisme, which means keeping of the Sabbath. But despite knowing that, or they should have known it, uh, how can I put this? I am not a Greek scholar, but I am a st scholar who has studied Greek. <laughs> and even with my limited Greek knowledge, you can read the rare word, it's obvious that the word is sabbatisme. Sabbatismo, I mean, you can look at it. Even even those who have an English language background, you can even see the letters, what they look like. They look pretty much like that. Now, the next part that he brought up was uh, to do with uh, 1 John 5, 7, and 8, which is uh, to um, so this came from the uh, uh, uninspired addition to the Latin Vulgate, and it's an unscriptural doctrine regarding the the, uh, the Trinity. Now, I just want to talk about a some of these here. One is a mistranslation of Genesis 1-2 has resulted in many not understanding the age of this world in very aspects, various aspects of prehistory. This has resulted in many Protestants making scientifically unsound statements that turn many against the reliability of Scripture. You know, if you've, you've got a situation nowadays where, um, as far as people go, you think there's really uh, two versions of stupidity. One is to accept the mainstream, secular, no God, it all just popped up idea with things such as uh, imaginary time and other nonsense that people like the late Dr. Stephen Hawking pushed, and that life just sprang up on its own, uh, which is impossible. I'm holding up a book we have, is God's Existence Logical, and in the back of it, I don't know how well you'll be able to read it, so let me just read it. I want to read something from Dr. George Wald from Harvard University. He won the Nobel Prize. He said, the reasonable view was to believe in spontaneous generation, life from nothing. The only alternative is to believe in a single primary act of supernatural creation. There's no third position. One only has to contemplate the magnitude of this task to concede that the spontaneous generation of living organism is impossible. Yet here we are as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. Now that's a stupid view. He's saying he's going to accept the impossible. And he said, why bring this up in this discussion about the King James Version of the Bible? Because of mistranslations and misunderstandings of Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, you've got various Protestants saying that Genesis 1, 1 was 6,000 years ago, and it's probably billions of years ago. So the scientists look and say, this is not possible that that started six, uh, this only existed 6,000 years ago. So they don't believe that, but instead they believe this other lie. Uh, we have, by the way, a sermon at the uh, Continuing COG channel about the Gap Doctrine, which explains all this in more depth. But I, my point today was to just mention that this is, there's a lot of serious problems caused by relying solely on the King James Version of the Bible, including the fact this is one of the reasons why the secularists believe stuff that's not true. And by the way, this booklet is also available at the ccog.org website. Let's see. I mentioned uh, the, about the Sabbatismo, and because this was mistranslated, Sabbatismos, they got many people not realizing that the seventh day Sabbath enjo is enjoined on Christians today. Um, we go into that in more depth for Protestants, if you will, in this particular book, Hope of Salvation. And we have the reality that Protestant translators have gotten many to break God's commandments, to violate them. We have a booklet on the Ten Commandments also, available at ccg.org, as well as the Biblical Holy Days. Protestant mis uh, the King James, some of the Protestant mistranslations have resulted in people not understanding about Holy Days. Now, as far as the Holy Days go, and I'm looking for our booklet on it here, which I think I brought in here. We've got one, should you keep God's Holy Days or demonic holidays? When you look at King James Version of the Bible, they added the word Easter in the book of Acts, but it's not in there. 
The word is uh, Pas Pascha, which means Passover. The same word is translated from the Greek 28 times as Passover in the King James Version. But in Acts, they put in Easter. And they did this because they had a bias. They didn't get the name of pagan goddess from the New Testament. It was not in there. To claim these people were not biased, and they put the word Easter in, instead of Passover, which they did 20 other times, should make it clear. Now, one of the things that uh, Chick Publications likes about the uh, King James Version of the Bible is it often uses the word A-T-L-L. And it indicates that it's wrong to, to transliterate the words in the Greek. And if you don't use what their term, uh, they think that people don't read, learn the right thing. And someone asks them about Gehenna and says the Bible refers to Gehenna as a place of death and pain. It says uh, the word H-E-L-L you also use, often use should be, is Gehenna. And uh, it says if you look at, uh, read a Bible written before 1400, you'll notice that they don't use that word. Instead they say Gehenna. Uh, you're committing sin here. You're telling people when lying to them you should know about Gehenna. That was the question to Czech publications. But instead they say Gehenna is properly translated A-T-L-L in, in the King James Bible. By the way, I'm only going to spell it because it's used too much as a curse word these days. Now, Czech publications says the word Gehenna comes to the Valley of Hinnom. simply renders the garbage dump or the Valley of Waste disposal burning garbage. It couldn't be an accurate translation because that's not what Jesus and the Apostles meant. So they've decided they didn't know what Jesus and the Apostles meant and he couldn't mean what they said. It meant the place you go where you die. Not until Young's literal translation in the 1800s, followed by the New Catholic American Bible, was the untranslated Gehenna put in. Now the person who wrote to them said, no, that's was before then, but okay. Gehenna is not a translation. It's just a transliteration. Translating letters, but not meaning. Now, Czech publication is basically saying it knows better than the word what the word's supposed to mean and the word Jesus actually used. And by the way, Gehenna does not mean the place people go where they die, which Chick Publication says they're flat out wrong. Now, uh, the word H-E-L-L originally the, meant to cover or to hide, and it came from something meaning a, a tailor's receptacle. But at time, it began to mean being underground. Now, you need to understand that the King James Version of the Bible improperly translates three words to be the same one. The three words in the New Testament are Hades, Gehenna, and Tartarus. And the uh, King James, every time, translates as H-E-L-L. -L. Now, one of them means what people think H-E-L-L -L means, at least people like Chick Publications. The fact is, there are three different Greek words, uh, and... People have misunderstood this because of things like the uh, uh, King James Version of the Bible. Also, because of the influence from Dante's uh, book, The Divine Comedy, or it's actually kind of a sort of poem, this area he called the Inferno or, or Infernus in Latin, many people got the wrong impression that God has this place of torturing that's going to last forever. And later, uh, the term H-E-L got attached to it, and that's how most Protestants and Roman Catholics now view it. Now, Chick Publications should know better. Even in its post against Gehenna, it had the following. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in H-E-L-L, Matthew 10.28. No power on earth can destroy a soul. The soul is a part of the person that exists before physical death. Gehenna has to be a place to destroy both body and soul. Now it's interesting that Chick Publications admits that the body and soul are destroyed in Gehenna. But that's not what Chick Publications teaches about H-A-L-L. They say, oh, you're going to be burning there forever. It, in Jesus' time, what was tossed in Gehenna burnt up and was no more. And we go into uh, that uh, in our book a little bit on Protestantism as well as uh, another book that we have. Going over here to find it, to get it. Probably stacked is a bit better. Universal Offer of Salvation. 
because of mistranslations, misunderstandings, and misteachings, most people do not understand God's plan of salvation. Also, because they don't keep the holy days, they misunderstand God's plan of salvation and intentional translation errors or biases in the King James Version of the Bible are a major factor in that. Now, Chick Publication also has the following. Hades has a big pagan meaning that's completely divorced from the Bible. What about Easter? Oh. Anyway, then it says, Sheol is a Hebrew word without any meaning to any ordinary reader. Have you ever heard people say they don't want to go to Henna? Gehenna? We need a Bible with a lot of H-E-L-L in it. We need to know, know where we are not going. The whole purpose of evangelism is to save people from H-E-L-L. That forceful warning word is found in the King James Bible. Uh, well, you got two or three problems with what he said. First of all, Hades is not completely divorced from the Bible. The New Testament shows that Jesus, yes, we have a book on Jesus here. Proof Jesus is the Messiah. This Jesus, the one who's the Messiah, he used the word Hades five times in the Texas Receptus, which is the text that the bulk of the uh, King James Version was translated from. Jesus wasn't trying to teach a pagan concept. Hades meant the grave. It didn't mean some ever-burning place of torture. That's a pagan concept that places like Chick Publications want to perpetuate. Now consider also that in Revelation 20, verse 14, it says, Death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. Now Hades is translated as H-E-L-L -L there in the King James Version. And it can't mean the lake of fire because Hades is being tossed into the lake of fire. Hope that makes sense to all of you. And by the way, no. The whole purpose of proclaiming the good news of the Bible is not to save people from the type of punishing place of torment that Chick Publications talks about. There is good news in the Bible. And we've got a book on that, as well as the mystery of God's plan. Why did God create anything? Why did God make you? And Chick Publications doesn't understand the true gospel or why God made anyone. Instead, they've got this distorted pagan concept about torture. One of the main purposes of evangelism, according to Jesus, go to Matthew 24, 14, is to have the gospel of the kingdom preached in all the world's a witness to all nations. And as it says in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, to make disciples of all the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to observing all things He's commanded us. I should also mention uh, one of the reasons to use the correct Greek manuscripts, like, like the, uh, what became the Texas Receptus, but the original stuff before then, is that some of them properly felt that Matthew 28, 19, 20 shouldn't be in the Bible, but it, it, it should be, and it's in the Texas Receptus. Through proper teaching, those who are converted will build godly character, so they will be able to give love in a unique way to make eternity better for themselves and all who ultimately will accept Jesus. And we go into that in our book, Mystery of God's Plan. But what about Gehenna? The word Gehenna represents the valley of Hinnom, which lay just outside of Jerusalem, in this place where refuge was constantly being burned up. It was first referred to in Scripture in Joshua 15.8, and is also associated with various pagan fire practices in the Old Testament. Trash, filth, dead bodies of animals, and despised criminals were thrown into Gehenna. Ordinarily, everything thrown in the valley was destroyed by fire. Christ used it to picture the terrible fate of unrepentant sinners. And understand that Jesus used the word Gehenna 11 times in the Texas Receptus. Jesus knew what it meant. But said Chick Publication and others want you not to comprehend what Jesus was really teaching. Now, the New King James and the uh, modern English version also fail as they translate the word Gehenna as H-E-L-L -L as well. But, the AFV and the YLT, a faithful version in Young's literal translation, get it right. But even the New King James and MEV don't translate Hades as H-E-L-L. -L. At least they put it as Hades. Now consider that Chick Publication said that Hades has a pagan meaning. 
And again, it overlooked the stuff about Easter. And um, let me read something from Hastings' uh, Dictionary of the Bible. In the authorized version, the word H-E-L-L is unfortunately used as rendering of three distinct words with different meanings. It represents the shield of the Old Testament and the Hades of the New Testament. It's, it's entirely misleading rendering, especially uh, New Testament passages. English revisers, therefore, have substituted Hades, going back to the original Greek word for H-E-L-L in the New Testament. The word H-E-L-L is used as the equivalent of the Greek word Tartarus in 2 Peter 2, 4, and more properly is equivalent of the Greek word Gehenna. So we, there's three different words, but they get this all wrong. And I can go through more depth, but scholars basically say that uh, Sheol, from the Old Testament, Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, and Hades from the uh, New Testament being, uh, basically being in the grave. The boat of the dead, if you will. Uh, and they teach that uh, Gehenna is a place things burn up. And Tartarus, by the way, it's only used once in the uh, uh, Bible. And it's a restrained condition for, for fallen angels. But that's essentially been moved over, if you will, and said, oh, this is, applies to all human beings who don't accept Jesus one way or the other, that either Protestants or Roman Catholics or somebody says, uh, and they're going to suffer forever. But that word's only used, Tartarus only used once, and it's for uh, angels. It's disappointing that the King James translators failed to properly translate the preserved Greek New Testament text. But there's other King James issues. Now, I want to read something from a Protestant scholar who teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary. His name is Dr. Daniel Wallace. He's a professor there. And here's something that uh, he wrote. This is why, under why I do not think the King James Bible is the best translation available today. <clears throat> it says, I can have no scriptural warrant for arguing that King James has exclusive rights to the throne. The Greek text which stands behind the New King James Bible, excuse me, the King James Bible, is inferior in certain places. The man who edited the text was a Roman Catholic priest and humanist named Erasmus. He was under pressure to get it to the press as soon as possible. Consequently, his edition has been called the most poorly edited volume in all of literature. It's filled with hundreds of typographical errors, which even Erasmus would acknowledge. Furthermore, I want to mention that uh, the King James Version erred, erred by assigning a male gender to the Holy Spirit. This is a major and a biased translation error. The Hebrew term for spirit in the Old Testament is grammatically female, and the Greek term in the New Testament is grammatically neuter. And this is noted by even Trinitarian scholars, which include, by the way, Dr. Uh, Daniel Wallace. Now, the mistranslation by the King James translators result in major misunderstandings of the Godhead and resulting in many believing differently about the Godhead than what early Christians believed. And more on what early Christians believed on the Godhead. I'm going to put up uh, two books again. Continuing History of the Church of God, as well as Hope of Salvation, How the Continuing Church of God Differs from Protestantism. Available, again, at ccog.org. Now, getting back to the King James Version of the Bible itself, many don't realize it originally included as an appendix the uh, Old Testament Apocrypha. And these weren't inspired by God and they shouldn't have been in there. And it, um, now, since it's not been in it for about 200 years, people don't realize that was a flaw from the original King James. Don't be deceived by men uh, who don't want to hold to what the original inspired text teaches. The King James has real errors and most certainly cannot be completely trusted as an accurate portrayal of the words of God. And another thing is words have a change in meaning. For example... And uh, one would not say, suffer the little children in the 21st century, but instead would say, allow the little children or permit the little children, for a translation of Mark 10.14. Okay, we wouldn't say suffer the little children, it's not how we use it. Furthermore, many modern English speakers don't use English, King James English. As a matter of fact, most don't. Uh, many words that were common in the 17th century aren't even used or even understood by people today. 
Now, interestingly, speaking of the 17th century, Dr. Peter Chamberlain, who seemed to be hold Church of God doctrines, he did not seem to quote the King James Version 1677 when he used the expression from James 2.10 that he that sinneth in one point is guilty of all. On the other hand, a Church of God leader by the name of William Sellers or Sellers did seem to quote the King James Version of his uh, in some of his books. It's not that it's inappropriate to cite the King James Version, but it's inappropriate to claim the translation is 100% accurate and is completely approved, or that it's completely approved by God, because that's simply not true. You can prove that it's wrong on certain spots. Now, I mentioned Dr. Wallace, and here's some things he wrote about uh, 1 John 5, 7, and 8, which is something we're going to talk about for a few moments here. And the King James uses this. To date, only a handful of Greek manuscripts have been discovered to have the Trinitarian formula in 1 John 5, 7, and 8, though none of them is demonstrably earlier than the 16th century. In 1 John 5, 7, and 8, the King James Bible speaks of three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. The Holy, all these three are one. Then, he, get this, he says, in 1516, uh, the Sidereus Erasmus, the Dutch humanist scholar, published the first printed Greek New Testament on March 1, 1516. When it came out, he didn't have this verse, 1 John 5, 7, there affirming the Trinity. There were Catholic scholars who got very upset with him for not putting it in there. In the second edition, in 1519, he didn't have it either. What he mentioned was in his notes in the second edition, I did not put this in because I did not see it in any Greek manuscript. His third edition of 1522, has it with the Trinitarian formula. This is something that has plagued English readers of the Bible, but not German readers, because Martin Luther based his New Testament on the 1519 edition didn't have that. So in 1519, Luther was using that edition and didn't have the Trinitarian formula. German Christianity has never had a problem, as its version of the Bible never had the Trinitarian formula of 1 John 5, 7, and 8. As stated, made it into Erasmus's 1522 text and then put in the King James Version of the Bible after Erasmus put it in basically at a protest. And he got it from the Latin. It seems that this particular reading was never part of the Greek New Testament until after there was a protest. It never affected Christians for any of the church councils. They never pointed that verse out because it didn't exist in the Bible. So they came up with the doctrine of Trinity on some other basis like the fact that uh, Emperor Constantine liked it and some other reasons. Now, the Trinitarian formula, 1 John 5, 7, 8, is not in the true Texas Receptus. And a lot of people want to believe it was, and sometimes they've said that Tertullian, in the late 2nd, early 3rd century, quoted it. Well, he was a Trinitarian, but I read Tertullian's writing, and no, I, he, did not, uh, he did not quote it. The reality, the reality is, unbiased scholars realize that 1 John 5, 7, and 8 editions were added centuries after the New Testament was originally written. Now, I want to show you a relevant copy of a section of the Codex Sinaiticus from 350. Now, I realize it's not a language that you're all very familiar with here, but I wanted to put this up. This is Greek. And here's a translation of 1 John 5, 7, which is what I just put up there from this. For they testify are three, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. The three are one. And that's not the, the, the three in heaven and the other stuff that they put in there. It was not in there. Okay? So this is the earliest, basically, rendering we can see of a, of a Greek text, and it is, does not have that in there. Also, I want to read from uh, L. Wayne's uh, uh, article, 1 John 5, 7, 8, in King James Onlyism. 1 John 5, 8. Ambrose, a Latin, quotes the passage as thus. But the same evangelist, and he might make it plain that he wrote concerning the Holy Spirit, says elsewhere, Jesus Christ came by water and blood, not by the water only, but by the water and blood. And the Spirit beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth, for there are three witnesses, the water, the spirit, and the blood. These three are one. That's the end of the Ambrose quote. But Wayne continues. Again, the phrase, these three are one, refers to the water, the spirit, the water, and the blood. Further, the passage is fully quoted here. It is absolutely clear that the comma is not in the text. What do I mean by the comma? This is called the Johnine 
comma. Matter of fact, you have an article on Wikipedia called that. This extra part about the, the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, three in heaven. That's they call the comma because someone put a comma and added that in there. It's simply not the case. It was not in Scripture. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Bruce Metzger, who's also a Trinitarian, said the text is missing from all Greek manuscripts except eight, and they appear of what looks to be a translation of the Latin Vulgate. So if somebody decided, oh, it's in Latin, let's just scribble this down and put it in Greek to make it look like. It's quoted in none of the Greek fathers, because if they'd known it, they would have uh, brought it up in the uh, Trinitarian uh, controversies. <clears throat> it's absent from manuscripts of all ancient versions, such as the Syriac, Coptic, Armenian, Ethiopic, Arabic, Slavonic, and uh, so it says the early sense of the passage being quoted as a part of, of an epistle is a 4th century Latin treatise called Liber Apologeticus attributed to the Spanish heretic Priscillian or to his follower Bishop Instanius. <clears throat> but one want to claim that um, this was always in there, it was inspired. That, <clears throat> that is not true. Basically what happened was there was a monk who read a non-biblical text. He decided to insert a comment he'd read somewhere else. It didn't come from the Bible. It's partially because of intentional errors like including those verses that Muslims claim the New Testament can't be trusted because so-called Christians changed it. I'm going to read 2 Peter 2. Verses 1 and 2. Peter warned, There will be false teachers among you who will bring in, secretly bring in destructive heresies. The monk secretly brought in the Trinitarian heresy and it got adopted. He put it in, in the text. By the time he put it in the text, by the way, uh, it had been the official position. It got adopted officially in 381 at the Council of uh, Constantinople that was convened by Emperor Theodosius. Anyway, the Peter warns about those who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. So they call us a cult because we hold to the original semi-Aryan or Vinitarian view of the Godhead. And again, you can read more about that here and in here. Peter warned about destructive heresies. Wouldn't that include people who changed the Bible? Including some associated with the King James Version of the Bible? Anyway, some Protestants believe they were ones to take over as guardians of the Bible. So let me read something that the old radio church of God put out in 1964. It's, a Protestant, it's the Bible a Protestant book. Quote, Protestants claim that, quote, the guardianship of the Greek New Testament passed from the Greek church to those who were more faithful to its teachings, namely to evangelical Protestants. Consistently, Christian textual criticism, therefore, is, a truly, is truly Protestant. It's the Protestant Reformation. God summoned men to return to the Holy Scriptures. If you really believe that, if you really think you believe the Bible, but you think you're Protestant, please study this particular book, which has hundreds of scriptures and hundreds of references to show you that no Protestantism is not based on sola scriptura. Well, that was a convenient rallying cry. But they didn't believe it. And this book proves it. Anyway, the uh, uh, old Radio Church of God then writes, Erasmus, a humanist scholar who was neither doctrinally Protestant nor Catholic, was the editor of the first printed New Testament in 1516. Now I'd like to read uh, something from the New World Encyclopedia. Erasmus rejected the manuscripts of Origen, as did Lucian of Antioch. Now Lucian of Antioch may have been Church of God. Lucian prevailed over Origen, especially in the East. The Bibles produced by the Syrian scribes presented the Syrian text of the school of Antioch, and this text became the form which displaced all others in the Eastern churches, and is indeed the Textus Receptus from which our authorized uh, version is translated. I'm sorry, that's from Wilkinson, the Truth Triumvirate. But this is from New World Encyclopedia. Lucian emphasized the need for textual accuracy and sought to limit the allegorical interpretation of the Alexandrian Christian tradition, which incorporated pagan philosophy. Lucian's edition became the basis of Texas Receptus from which most of the Reformation-era New Testament translations were made. 
there were two basic groups. There were the allegorists, which is from Alexandria, Egypt, led by people like Clement of Alexandria and Origen, and they didn't believe the Bible should be taken literally, and the Greco-Roman churches adopted that, and unfortunately a lot of that influence uh, hit the uh, Protestants. Then there was the opposing school, the literal school, the school that the Church of God would be associated with, when it believes the Bible and uh, believes it's only allegory when it's clearly allegory. Now I'd like to read something else. Now this is from an article called The King James Version Defended. It says, Westcott and Hort believed that from the very beginning the traditional Byzantine text was an official text with official backing. And this is the reason why it overcame all rival texts and ultimately reigned supreme in the uses of the Greek church. They regarded the traditional text as the product of a thorough going revision of the New Testament, which took place in Antioch in two stages between 250 and 350 AD. They believed that this text was the deliberate creation of certain scholarly Christians at Antioch, and that the presbyter Lucian, died 312, was probably the original leader in this work. And our, the position of the continuing Church of God is there were true Christians in Antioch into the third century. We suspect from what we've been able to tell that Lucian was as well. Now after the death of Serapion of Antioch, uh, or the martyrdom in uh, 211, the main bishop that's in various succession lists that the Greeks use, Greek Orthodox use, we don't consider Christian, but there were still Christian leaders in that area, including and through uh, Lucian. Now Lucian's of Antioch's textual work lies at the base of the Textus Receptus, some have dismissed Lucian's uh, involvement because, quote, early church councils and church fathers are completely silent on this matter, and because there are some papyri in the Greek that predate Lucian. But L Lucian did have involvement. Leaders of beliefs like Lucian didn't attend the Greco-Roman councils, according to Roman Catholic scholars, and they're also condemned, not praised, uh, by these councils. The fact that there are some pre-Lucian documents, of course, doesn't mean Lucian wasn't involved with the Bible. He was. The version associated with Lucian was essentially supreme in the East, whereas in Rome, they preferred a Latin text. Receiving the uh, literal sense of uh, Lucian laid stress on the need for textual accuracy, and he strove to uh, revise the Septuagint, on the original Hebrew, and his edition was used in the fourth century. Let me explain that. Uh, he was Greek, so he had uh, the uh, Septuagint, which was the Old Testament written in Greek. But he, used, he was a Hebrew scholar, so he basically took a Septuagint and he fixed it based on the Hebrew. He didn't think God improved it by making uh, the Hebrew Greek, but he improved the, uh, the, the Greek by going back to the Hebrew. And he went back to the original text. And the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia says that uh, he published a, uh, uh, also in addition to the Old Testament, uh, uh, an edition of the New Testament. Now let me read uh, something from uh, the True Triumphant from Wilkinson. During the Dark Ages, the received text was practically unknown outside the Greek text. It was altogether too little known that the real editor of the received text was Lucian. Lucian's unrivaled success in verifying, safeguarding, and transmitting the divine writings left a heritage which all generations be thankful. Lucian, the school, produced and edited a definite and complete Bible. So we see a chain of custody of the received text reportedly passed through Lucian, and Lucian wasn't Protestant. Now, in the 19th century, I want to read something that was reported. Talk about Lucian. We're going to form a just evidence of the purity of the text of Lucian. And so I'm not going to go through all of that, but basically he used the right text, and from him we got the text of Receptus. Um, and even though there were some mistakes and some things that got lost, uh, that the Protestant scholars ended up using for the King James, it was actually the basis of most of the uh, King James version of the Bible. Now, despite 
early Catholic, excuse me, early Protestant scholars know about Lucian, beginning no later than about the 19th century, many Protestant, by the late 19th century, many Protestant scholars began to reject various of the Byzantine texts of Synopsis text. The old Radio Church of God wrote the following. It may come to shock to you know that scholars have rejected nearly 95% of all extant Greek manuscripts of the Bible. These very manuscripts, which have been preserved by the Greek-speaking word world, those whom God gave responsibility for copying and preserving his word. Instead, modern Protestant translators and critics turn to a corrupted 5% of the manuscripts found in Egypt in the Latin-speaking world. These Byzantine manuscripts have been rejected due to false theories of men. And that's what I was getting to. Basically what happened was there were Protestant scholars by the name of Westcott and Hort. They believed that because a lot of the Egyptian texts of Alexandria and Egypt were older copies than the ones in uh, the Byz Byzantine area, that they were more reliable. And one of the reasons that they, those texts lasted as long as they did is the climate was drier in Egypt and they didn't uh, uh, go away so fast. But the other reality is the Byzantine Greeks, they followed the Jewish custom of destroying older manuscripts when they got many new copies. Okay? And so, as far as uh, 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 Dr. Fenton Hort of uh, Westcott and Hort, he said, I'm so ignorant of Hebrew and what is worse of the Greek text in the New Testament, I have all but discarded them. He said that the Texas Recepsis, by the way, was villainous. Now that's the version of the Bible that we use and the one that the New King James Version and the Old King James Version was based upon. Uh, Protestants have asserted that Dr. Hort and Dr. Brooke Westcott had an allegory, allegorical view or like Alexandrian Egypt view of scripture and that Westcott actually accepted certain apocryphal texts. But for basically those scholars, the most modern Protestant scholars use the wrong text these days. Anyway, since about the 1900s, most Protestant, early 1900s, most Protestant translations have been done based on the inferior non-Byzantine text, such as one done by Everhard Nestle, first published in 1898, called Novum Testum Grassi, which was later updated. Uh, the 25th edition was uh, edited by somebody named, by the name of Kurt Allen, and the joint work has been called the Nestle Allen Greek Text, or the NGT. As far as their Greek text goes, uh, it's missing words, and it tends to be less doctrinally clear than the Textus Receptus. For example, the Textus Receptus says that, Mary, that Jesus was Mary's firstborn son in Matthew 125, which implies Mary had other sons later, whereas the uh, uh, NGT, uh, the Nestle Greek text, doesn't have that word. And for another example, the NGT doesn't have the word kingdom in Mark 1.14, whereas the text of Receptus does. The NGT also leaves out parts of the Bible, like John 7.53 through John 8.11, as well as 19 other verses, verses of the uh, New Testament. Uh, the NGT is simply not reliable, as, as, uh, there's like a th as the text of Receptus. There's, like a thousand, there's actually over a thousand differences from what I've read. Um, and it also messes up things with the with the holy days, such as Acts uh, eighteen twenty one, which the text of Sepsis says, "I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem," and that's not part of the NGT. Now also, there's something called the New Agreement uh, New Testament. It's a version that's put out in twenty twenty by Lutheran supporters. It doesn't even include the word Israel in it, despite the fact it being used seventy three times in the New Testament. So we've seen throughout history translators and publishers who decide they've got bias and they're going to do something about it. And so there's a uh, other other uh, problems uh, regarding this. A lot of the uh, new translators use something called the Biblia Hebraica. And say, what's wrong with that? Well, according to the Encyclopedia Judaica, the compiler of the Biblia Hebraica rendition of the Old Testament was uh, Gerhard Kiltel's father. He was a vehement anti-Semite who, far from being a devout Christian, was a devout believer in Hellenistic religions. Both his father and son were liberal German scholars and higher critics. 
that is a belief scripture should be understood as scholars interpret and alter it. Matter of fact, one of the reasons I'm not part of the old, well, what became the changed Worldwide Church of God was they told me we had to rely on interpretations of what, how scholars felt the Bible meant to be taught as opposed to what it really taught. Anyway, all translations are subject to error, so which one's best? That's what I get asked a lot. I don't know which one is necessarily best all the time, but I tend to use the New King James Version. We in the Continuing Church of God do, though, do that. How come? One, it uses modern English. And two, it's widely accessible. But because it has translation flaws and uh, sometimes some clarity issues, I'll we'll use other translations. For example, when I'm referring to the Holy Spirit and there's any pronouns involved, most of the time I'm going to use the AFV because it gets the pronouns right every time. Uh, the King James, I think, gets it right once, and there's another translation gets it right once. So generally speaking, I'll use AFV for that. And now, if I want to make a point to a particular group, like the Roman Catholics or the Eastern Orthodox or Jehovah's Witnesses, I'll use their translations of the Bibles because despite various differences, hundreds, even thousands of differences, most of the time, most of the text, and most of the translators actually agree. That doesn't mean they're all the same. That, but it means that most of the time we can quote from other passages or other translations and other versions and they will tell you a reasonably decent rendition of the Word of God. But they're not 100% accurate and they have intentional errors and people have relied on those intentional errors to do away with the Sabbath, do away with the Holy Days, misunderstand the Godhead, misunderstand God's plan of salvation, etc. Now, I want to talk about versions of the Bible. Oops. This is uh, the one I want to get. In general, the best translations are based on the Masoretic text for the Old Testament and Textus Receptus for the New Testament. Some of the main Bibles that do this are the uh, AFE, the Faithful Version, the Geneva Bible, Green's Literal Translation, the Interlinear Bible, the King James Version, the Modern English Version, New King James Version, and Young's Literal Translation. And I mentioned about grammar and pronouns. But what about other translations? Well, there's the American Standard Bible. It uses uh, a Masoretic text but with Septuagint influence, and it uses Westcott and Hort for the New Testament, which means it's overlooked 95% of the old, the ancient. Uh, Byzantine text. Then, uh, basically, same thing for the Holman Christian Bible, except it uses the Nestle Allen uh, 27th edition, again, instead of the text of Receptus from the New Testament. The New American Bible, uh, same kind of problems, uh, uh, sorry, using Septuagint and not using the text of Receptus. Uh, I'm, it's the same thing is basically true for the New American Standard Bible uh, and the New international version. And by the way, it doesn't mean everything in the international version is wrong. As a matter of fact, a couple of times it's actually more accurate than the King James and New King James. But the, the textual basis was not the one that's the preferred one. Now, the New Revised Standard Version uh, also uses uh, stuff that we would base it on. And the, the New World Translation by the Jehovah's Witnesses in the same category. We need to believe the inspired Word of God. Now there's something else I guess I should mention. And that is um, paraphrases. What a, a paraphrase is, it's a translation that tries to use modern language to capture the thought behind a word. So translations in general, they look at what the words, each words in, let's say, the Hebrew or the Greek text, and they say, well, this means this in this language, blah, 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 and they put it together in a way hopefully we understand. But there's grammar issues and some other issues from one language to the other. What a paraphrase tries to do is just reword the whole thing in a way they think it's what it's trying to say. Now sometimes this is right, but they, uh, the ones that I was looking at today, like the uh, easy to read version, uh, Good News Bible, today's English version, and the uh, Living Bible, they didn't use the proper Hebrew or Greek text, or the best Hebrew or Greek text to begin with, so they start off wrong. And some of them just took other Bibles and just reworded what they'd already seen. But it can be easier if you want to tell some stories or whatever to, to read through those translations, but be careful about basing doctrine on these paraphrased 
versions of the Bible. Uh, the inspired language of the Bible was not English. It was not the King James or any other uh, uh, translation. So what do I do? Again, I tend to use the New King James. Uh, I've got various computer programs that I use that have multiple Bibles on there. I know where many of the problems are in the New King James, particularly have to do with Sabbath, Holy Days, uh, and uh, 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 Gehenna, and the, the gender of the Holy Spirit. That I know. Beyond that, it's usually fine. Now, there have been over 1,500 ancient Greek manuscripts that have been found. And there's at least parts of, uh, that have at least parts of the New Testament. Plus, there's at least 19,000 early translations of the New Testament into other languages. Nothing like this exists for any other book in the ancient world. The closest book to the New Testament in terms of manuscript, ancient manuscripts is the Iliad of uh, Homer, which is attested by 643 manuscripts. And the oldest of those, by the way, was 500 years after it was written. We have people say, oh, well, the New Testament, uh, the oldest stuff we have, it, it was uh, too far after it was written, and that kind of a thing. Where the reality is, for all the ancient literature, that's, that, is the, that is the case. I had held up, I'll hold it up again, this particular piece from the New Testament, uh, Rhineland's 52, looks like it could be within 20 or 30 years of the original, uh, maybe even 5 or 10 years. No, no one really knows for sure, but it's not 500 years. It was much closer. And one of the things I should say, that modern readers may be surprised on how expensive early uh, production of uh, books were. It's been estimated by uh, Randolph Richards that to make a copy of Matthew's Gospel cost the equivalent of 2,238 U.S. dollars. So by having 5,800 Greek manuscripts shows the value of the, of the scriptures. And there are other manuscripts, by the way, that got burnt by the Greco-Romans and, and others, and the Arabs, I think. And in terms of accuracy, the New Testament is full of personal eyewitness accounts, and let's go to uh, John 19. If you've got your Bible, we'll go to John 19. Start in verse 35. And he who has testified, and he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows the things he's telling the truth, so you may believe. So John's saying, that's what he's saying about the Bible, the New Testament that he wrote, you can believe it. If you go to the next chapter, chapter 20, and read verse 31. But these were written to you that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Now I want to go to 1 John 1. We'll start in verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and we've heard we declare to you that you may have the fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. There's no darkness in him. And when I hold this piece up, by the way, this comes actually from John's writings. Now, although Luke was not an eyewitness, uh, he said he had testimony from eyewitnesses, and what he wrote you could rely on with certainty in Luke 1, verses uh, 1 through 4. Plus, he accurately refers to various facts and geographical points in the book of Acts. And I won't go through all of those, but they're all listed in this particular book, Who Gave the World the Bible. And by the way, as far as the book of Acts is concerned. Uh, evidence points have been written about 62 uh, A.D. Now the New Testament itself does give an accurate account of Jesus and holds many doctrines and prophecies that people should strive to understand today. As a matter of fact, one of the things in our book that I held up before, Proof Jesus is the Messiah, there's 10 or 12 prophecies that Jesus gave in the New Testament that were fulfilled outside the New Testament. Okay, now this book a lot has a lot of prophecies that Jesus fulfilled from the Old Testament and the New Testament. But critics of the Bible say, ah, the New Testament writers just wrote in that Jesus did those things, because he really didn't. Well, that's nonsense. Jesus did do it. 
They don't really have an explanation of the fact that Jesus made prophecies in this book that have been coming to pass after this book, after me, the book was written. I put the prophecies of Jesus in this book, but they're obviously from the Bible. So I want to go over just a, uh, a summary of some points about the New Testament. The book of Isaiah prophesied that disciples would bind and seal the testimony and the law in Isaiah 8, verse 12, meaning the books of the Bible. The Apostle Paul had Mark bring the parchments, the custody of which ended up with the Apostle Peter. And Peter was often with the Apostle John. So we've got, we've got a chain of custody of the uh, books of the New Testament. The Apostle John was the last writer of the New Testament, so he was the one who was in the best position to finalize what the Scripture was, what the canon was. John passed the canon of Scripture to Polycarp of Smyrna, and there's even a record from something called the Harris Fragments that says the Apostle John passed the canons on to Polycarp. Now in the second century, Polycarp, who was made uh, Bishop of Smyrna by the Apostle John, uh, we might use the word pastor today, in the second century, he wrote a letter to the Philippians and he said that they were, quote, well versed in sacred scriptures, which points to the fact that in order to do so, they had to know what the scriptures were. In the second century, Melito was a bishop of the Church of God in Smyrna, and a saint according to record Roman sources. He verified the list of the Old Testament and didn't have the Apocrypha in it. And I'm mentioning all of this. I want to essentially finalize this up about the canon of the New Testament and the Bible was known by the Church of God. In the late second century, Irenaeus wrote that Polycarp taught what he was taught by been taught by the apostles, and, and that such teachings were handed down. In the late second century, Polycrates, bishop of Ephesus, said he had gone through, quote, every holy scripture, which means early Church of God people knew what the books of the Bible were. In the early 3rd century, Serapion of Antioch stated that the books of the Bible had been handed down. And those would have been books that people such as Lucian would have gotten to. Now, the Eastern Orthodox incorrectly believed that the translation from Hebrew to Greek resulted in a superior New Te Old Testament than the original one. But in the 4th century, Lucian of Antioch, he was involved with the Old Testament by using the original Hebrew to fix errors in Septuagint. He was also involved with what later became known as the Textus Receptus of the New Testament. And I would assert that the uh, original traditional text that Serapion had was completely correct, and I presume that's the one that Lucian ended up being involved with. Now after Lucian, who was killed in 312, the Nazarene Christians, late 4th century, early 5th century, said that God had given them the Bible presumably through early faithful leaders. We have continuity of scriptures from the beginning of the church age throughout Church of God history. Furthermore, there were the Proto-Waldensians and the Waldensians, and they were involved in the chain of custody of the scriptures into the late Middle Ages. Interestingly, or strangely, it took until 1546 for the Church of Rome to finalize their canon. Now, in the 1600s, Church of God leaders cited books of the canon the same way we in the Continuing Church of God cite them today. And it took until 1672 for the Eastern Orthodox to finalize their canon. And that includes books that the uh, Protestant and Roman Catholics don't accept as canonical. I guess I'll also mention that in uh, 1830, Joseph Smith first published the Book of Mormon, which allegedly contained stuff back from the 2200 BC that no early Christian ever cited. So this wasn't part of, part of it as well. It wasn't part of the Bible. It wasn't part of the New Testament. Uh, the Church of God has never accepted the Book of Mormon as divinely inspired or the additional books of the Old Testament that various ones took, nor the various false gospels that were written after the Apostle John died. We, the continuing Church of God, believe it's theologically improper to say that God did not reveal what his books were to the apostles and that they didn't pass it on and that we haven't had until today. Knowing the books is important but also understanding that the languages that these books are written in, the New Testament particularly from 
uh, Greek, the Old Testament, from Hebrew, was the basis for the translations we have, the best translations we have in the English language. Well, no particular one translation is, is flawless. And I went through some of the flaws of the uh, King James Version of the Bible. And as I say, if you want more of them, you can go to our free book, Who Gave the World the Bible. The reality is that most of the time, uh, when you read from different translations, they do convey much of the truth of the Bible. But on various points, including to do with salvation, uh, holy days, the Sabbath, uh, the nature of God, you've got to be careful because, um, because of mistranslations and using the wrong text. A lot of people want to believe something other than what this book says. But if you're a true Christian, you do want to believe what this book says. And this series of sermons hopefully has given you tools to better understand why we need to continue in Church of God, use the books that we do, and why we recognize them as scriptures inspired by God. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.